Welcome back to the swamp my friends and welcome if you are new. Today is going to be another bone chilling episode of the dark swamp. Of course I'm your host swamp dweller here to take you through a thrilling journey into the darkest corners of the human psyche. Tonight we delve into the eerie realm of North Dakota, a place where secrets lurk in the vast expanse of the prairies and whispers of the supernatural echo through the night. As always, what makes this show special is that these stories come from viewers just like you. And as always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. Now, without further ado, be sure to get ready for these creepy and allegedly true North Dakota horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. Road Trip Horror by Bree. So this is not a paranormal experience or anything like that, but this is one of the most terrifying events of my life. To take things back to the beginning, at the time of the experience, I was around 14 years old. I am now 17. I was a competitive dancer, and traveling and hotel stays came with that. On this particular trip, we were going to Fargo, North Dakota. We would be there for about five days, so we needed to find a reasonably priced, obviously safe hotel. My mom, my best friend, Beth, and Beth's mom were going to carpool the four hours to Fargo and stay in the same hotel room. We made the four hour drive and pulled up to the day's inn we had booked. Everything went as usual. My mom and Beth's mom checked in while Beth and I sat in the locked car. Once our moms returned with our room keys, we got our suitcases and went to our room. We were on the second floor, and being in the city for a dance competition, we had a ton of luggage. To our disadvantage, the hotel only had stairs and no elevators, only a tiny flight of winding, very annoying, narrow stairs. Let me explain the layout of this hotel. When we entered the hotel doors, the check-in desk was at our right, there were two couches sitting opposite side of where we were to our left. Straight and forward of the entrance doors was a door to the pool. And going past the check-in desk, you could turn left or right to get to the main floor of hotel rooms. At the end of each hallway to your left was a staircase I mentioned earlier. Returning to the story, we walked into the hotel and took a right at the check-in desk. And we went to the end of the hall and went to the stairs, our luggage clunking behind us. Once we made it up the stairs, our hotel room was halfway down the hall to the left. We approached our room, and as Beth's mom tried to use our key card to open the wooden door, the light on the door, which would usually turn green, saying we could enter, turned red, meaning our card was not activated properly. So Beth's mom went back to the front desk to get a new card. I, my mom, and Beth waited outside our room, joking and laughing about how our trip was off to such a great start, when a short, skinny, balding man approached us. He looked to be in his 20s or maybe even early 30s. He came up to my mom and asked, Where'd you get your tattoos? My mom at the time only had a couple of smaller, less noticeable tattoos, so you would have had to been staring to really notice them. My mom responded, Just from a few friends at home who do tattoos back home. He then told us all, Well, if you're interested, you can come to my room. He motioned towards his room, And I can give you all some new ink. We politely declined, and my mom told the man we were only 14. He mumbled to himself and returned to his room. Just as he entered, Beth's mom came down and asked who that guy was. We explained the conversation and forgot about it as we entered our room. Later that day, we decided to go out and eat at a small restaurant that was probably like 10 minutes from the hotel. I was the first one to exit the room, and at the end of the hallway, across from the stairs, was the same guy sitting on the windowsill looking outside. I gave my mom a look. You know the eye when you don't want to draw attention to yourself by directly pointing or saying, Look over there! She casually looked and we gathered enough courage to walk down the hall towards the stairs. As we approached him, I came upon the shocking realization that he was giggling to himself and carving something into the window with a knife. I let out a small gasp, and he turned around to me and gently stroked the blade. Me, Beth, our moms, booked it down the stairs and ran to the front desk to alert the guy working there. He honestly didn't seem to care. He told us he would look into the matter. Mine and Beth's moms stood there at the desk talking to the man, and I asked Beth's mom for the keys to the vehicle 
so Beth and I could go sit safely. She just unlocked the doors to the vehicle and I called Beth to follow me. She was texting her boyfriend and told me to wait for her. Our moms had just finished talking to the guy, so we were all standing in the doorway waiting for Beth when I turned around and noticed the man standing directly behind her, peering over her shoulder at her phone. I grabbed her arm and told her we needed to go. She kept resisting and saying she needed to respond to her boyfriend before we left because she wouldn't have Wi-Fi at the restaurant. Finally, I screamed, Beth, get off your damn phone and move. We got to the car and got in. We drove to the restaurant and Beth and I were hysterical. Once we got there, we tried to call the hotel and tell them we weren't staying there that night and we wanted a refund. The manager was reluctant and asked us to come back so we could talk about the situation. I don't know why, but we went back and gathered up all of our belongings as fast as we could, throwing whatever we could fit into whichever bag was closest. Beth's mom was so freaked out she was throwing up heavily in the bathroom. I honestly have no idea when the police were called, but as we exited our room, the man's door was open a crack, and an older woman sat there. I think she was trying to calm down the creepy man. I peeked in and saw three giant trash bags under his bed, and weapons sitting on the little table across from him. Again, being the idiot I am, I gasped, and the two people in the room turned around. We quickly ran downstairs with all of our stuff and went to a new hotel, a very expensive one unfortunately, but we felt safer. The front desk worker at the day's inn was just a part-time guy and his shift had already ended. He got thrown into a situation that he could care less about, and once we talked about our refund since we hadn't even stayed the night there, he gave us our money back and said, This should never happen. And I know my boss wouldn't want me to refund your stay, but this is unacceptable. And if they want to fire me for helping you guys out, then so be it. God bless that guy, and I hope he knows that he was a godsend in that moment, even though it probably was just him not really caring about the job. But he did seem a little concerned towards the end once we saw how creepy this guy was being. I don't know what were in those garbage bags. I don't know why this guy had so many weapons. I mean, I'm talking about guns, knives, maybe even swords or machetes. I don't even know how to explain it. It looked like a freaking medieval display in there. I'm just lucky that me, my family, and friends all got out of there safely and didn't have any other bad times on that trip to North Dakota. Hellhound Encounter by Dalrith This story takes place roughly one year ago. One night, I got off work, keeping in mind that I have and still have a bicycle as my primary method of travel. I can get up to 20 miles per hour while riding depending on the weather conditions and if I'm going down or uphill. I rode the most direct route to my apartment, roughly about three miles from work. While traveling down this road, I felt uneasy, like I felt like I was being watched, and I began hearing weird noises to my left. I turned to look at the source of the noise. The noise was coming from what looked to be some sort of giant dog, which was hard to see because it was nighttime and it was obscured by the bushes. The dog turned its head at me, and I saw hellish, red glowing eyes staring me down. I was thinking the red eyes must be a reflection of a street lamp. I kept going and heard the dog running at me. I instantly cranked my bike to high gear. Now, I have solid legs from riding a bike everywhere I go in the city. This is the largest city in North Dakota. As I sped up, I could still hear the dog chasing me. I looked under my arm and this dog was not a stray nor a coyote. This dog's eyes were glowing a deep crimson red. With every bit of strength I had, I got my bike to go faster and faster, easily breaking 30 miles per hour if I had to guess. I thought my legs were literally going to explode. This thing was chasing me for blocks. It got incredibly close and at one point I thought it would take me off the bike altogether or at the very least swipe at my tire. And if it did that, I would have been a goner. Then, after chasing me for what I would have to guess is around four blocks, I suddenly stopped running. I looked behind me and all I saw was a black mist. This thing had disappeared right in front of my eyes. My heart was racing, and then a smell of burning wood and rotting meat came over me. I don't know why I was being chased down by a messed up dog. I don't know if it was some sort of hellhound. I have no idea. That's why I'm riding into this show. I hope somebody listening can give me an idea of what it is I may have encountered this night. Discovering Something Truly Awful by Anonymous I moved to North Dakota with my friend to work in the oil field business. I'll call him Sean. 
I was initially unsure of what the job entailed, but I knew it meant a lot of income and being able to see and work with my longtime friend pretty much sold me on the deal. As it turned out, I loved the job. 12 hour days on the day shift with the kind of money we were making was the easy street in my opinion. All we did during the day was stay on site and ensure the place didn't burn down. The job was perfect. This all came to a halt one day when my boss came to me and asked if I wanted to work the night shift instead and even go around to different sites. We all know if your boss is asking, it's likely not wise to say no. So I accepted. I checked six sites thrice a night with two hours of downtime between each site. Now to give you an idea of the placement of these sites, imagine places at least 15 miles apart, sometimes even further, in the middle of nowhere with only farms and dirt roads near for miles. That's how these sites were and how alone I'd be out while at night. Another thing is winter was setting in, and we had constant snow and blizzards. Now that you got a great visual of my situation, I will begin to explain my experience while working the night shift. There was one site. Out of all the particularly creepy sites, this site was the farthest away on my route and is the most dimly lit. Cliché, I know. Arriving at the site, I pull up to the pump house, put on my gloves and a hard hat, switching my lights on as I do. I step outside. Walking around, I'm careful with my steps as the headlight only illuminates what you're looking at. Everything else is pitch black, cold, and snowy. The thing about the snow is you can tell if anyone has been around or is around, but there were no truck tracks, no feet prints, nothing like that. My usual search goes from left to right, looking closely for leaks or potential leaks on the tanks roughly 20 feet tall by 10 feet wide. Coming up on my last tank, I noticed a pair of white tennis shoes dart behind a tank. At first, I thought I was just seeing things. Why would anybody be out here without a truck, and why would they be out here in the cold? This made my stomach sink partially out of confusion, but mostly because I was 20 miles away from any civilization, and it was like 15 degrees outside. The thought again crossed my mind. What would any sane person be doing out here without any sort of vehicle? Slowly and quite hesitantly, I approach the tank. I'm taking it slow, one step at a time, and I'm beginning to feel more and more on edge. A tiny white rabbit hops out from the area, and my heart nearly explodes. I throw my head back, sigh in relief, and laugh at the realization that it was just a bunny. This being at the end of the line, I find a place to park soon after and kick back the seat to relax. You need to understand sleeping on the job isn't something you're supposed to do, but it happens sometimes, and before I knew it, I was out like a light. Forty minutes later, my body spazzes awake, and I look around to see no one. Needing to pee, I step out, but freeze before I can even step on the ground. There are now tracks in the snow leading to my truck. But these aren't rabbit tracks. These are human. They aren't the right size to be mine, either. The trail leads over to the tanks I was checking earlier. I questioned who the hell could be out here and why, and once more I began to feel creeped out. I got that sinking feeling again as I followed the tracks. I grabbed the giant wrench from the truck that I carry just in case. Was whoever was out here crazy? Did they potentially need my help? I wasn't so sure. And about 20 feet from the tank, I froze and called out, asking who was there and if they needed my help. Silence sets in for a moment. The only sound coming from the snow is the wind blowing. I feel... I feel loneliness at the same time, yet I know I'm potentially being watched. The loneliness is that realization that I'm on my own if something goes wrong. Trying to set this thought aside, I tell whoever is back there that I'm well aware they're here. Still, silence is the only response I get. I walk forward five more feet and peer around the tank. What I see doesn't immediately register, but it shocks me when I do. There's blood, and I mean a lot of blood. I felt nauseous but was curious, so I stepped closer. That's when I see an antler. Is it a deer? I go close enough to see a dead deer. Its throat slit and blood everywhere. Its organs were also in a transparent display, steaming in the snow. Someone or something had recently just eviscerated this deer and left it here. Who or what the hell would do this and why? I turn my attention back to the shoe prints and it makes it obvious that there was a lot of shuffling around the deer. I'm not very convinced that whoever was out here was gone, and I'm confused as all hell at this point. Then I notice the shoe prints leading off to the back of the tanks. Slowly and exceptionally hesitant now, 
I follow these tracks. I'm shaking, but not from the snow. No, I'm shaking from damn fear. The tracks themselves appear to be blood red. The trail leads to a drop-off, and I peer down into the distance. About 40 feet away, I see something that makes me basically poop myself. I swear I see a half-human face looking back at me from over the hill. The beginning was old and tattered. The long, mangy hair, blood from the nose, everything was just hard to describe. I jumped so hard I fell, but was immediately on my feet seconds later. I threw all my stuff in my truck bed, got into my truck and floored it away as quickly as possible. I was dizzy and freaking out, thinking about how this thing had been right outside my truck looking at me while I slept at one point. Eventually I got home and I told the first person what I saw. I told them I noticed the deer and thought it was strange, at which point they removed what was left of the deer from the site. Another resident of the area who is significantly older than me who was on site that day mentioned it looked like a couple of coyotes got to it and were trying to drag it out of a predator's site. I knew better though. I worked with this company, and I still work with them now. I still work nights and have to check on this site. I'm always in and out in minutes, I never linger, nor do I sleep while I'm out there. I don't know what the heck that thing was, but I don't want to find out either. Small Town, North Dakota Horror Stories by Andy J. This happened to some of my buddies and me during the summer of 2021 after my high school graduation. I'm from a small town in North Dakota, and my buddies and I are the stereotypical rednecks of the town. You know the type, who drives loud trucks and is always armed somehow or another. We were doing the most, and especially what teenagers do for fun in the Midwest, driving around and shooting signs. When we get low on ammunition, one of my friends, we'll call him Gary, recommends we check out this snowmobiling warming hut where he's experienced some paranormal activity. Now, my buddies and I are all Christians and are very religious, but we couldn't pass up on this opportunity either because we were all so buzzed, or maybe it was because we were dumb teenagers with nothing to do. So... We arrive at the old shack and sit in my other buddy's car. We'll call him Larry. He has an F-150. We turn off the headlights and the dash and look and listen. Even though I didn't believe in the paranormal and was quite skeptical at the time, I felt reassured that I had my AK with me. It's important to note that in North Dakota during the summer, it can get pretty hot and it's highly dark in the evening. We were all content, feeling good, when someone in the back seat suddenly said it felt like he was being watched. After that, he said something kind of weird. I flipped off the safety of my AK and tried to be aware as possible. And then suddenly they shouted, Holy crap! in the most terrified, helpless voice I had ever heard coming from them. He tells us to look in Larry's rearview mirror. What I saw was genuinely horrifying. In his rearview mirror stands this glowing white figure, roughly seven or eight feet tall. It's only about 30 yards from us, peeking behind a tree. Larry throws his truck in reverse to get a better look, but just as abruptly as it appeared, it was gone. I fired a few rounds in its general direction, and immediately after I did, the air went cold. After that, Larry floored it, tearing out like we were in the Dukes of Hazard. We were all spooked to our bones, but one of my buddies, we'll call him Barry, says he never saw a thing. Now the white figure was terrifying, but the creepiest part is why didn't Barry see what we all saw? My Most Disturbing Story at a Fast Food Area by Anonymous my most disturbing story regarding fast food workers would be working at Burger King in my native of North Dakota. I was the go-to guy for any job the others didn't want. I was in high school then and usually worked around 25 hours a week to earn money to fund my extracurricular activities. I cleaned, cooked, washed trays, and served from time to time. But most of all, I was a magnet for odd things. In the two years that they were open before I started, they didn't have drainage issues, fecal issues, vomiting, or anything else. But lucky me, when I started, my first day consisted of cleaning projectile vomit from the kitchen. One of the cooks got ill during his shift and absolutely vomited everywhere, and I mean everywhere. But still we remained open and kept all of our tickets under our 10 minute max. 
Fast forward a few weeks and our soda slash ice storage drain under the fridge stopped working. We had to move the fridge, clean out the drain, and the drain was full of gelatinous brown stuff that smelt like raw sewage. A few nights later, some kid had explosive diarrhea all over our dining area. He somehow hit three different tables and over a dozen chairs, and about 80 square feet of wood flooring. Shockingly, we stayed open, and I was forced to clean between cooking and poop, basically exposing food to who knows what kind of bacteria. I did wash my hands, I did change my gloves, but there's only so much you can do, you know? Another good one was when our GM found out we had a rat problem in one of the walk-in fridge units. The restaurant was closing for just a couple weeks because of our slow season, smack dab in the middle of one of those brutal North Dakota winters. One of the super smart shift supervisors decided to close the door with the rats inside. I don't know whether or not he had seen them. I don't know what really went on, but when I came back to open the kitchen, I found about 30 dead babies and a mother rat. This was bad enough on its own, seeing all those twisted up babies quiet with their mother nearby. But when it came to donning the gloves, picking up their little bodies one by one and tossing them into plastic trash bags, I turned out... It turned out one wasn't as dead as they appeared to be. The moment I laid my hand around the mother rat, she woke up. I have no idea how she wasn't dead. I mean, she must have had any food or water for quite a while unless she had somehow found a way. But she was alive and angry. She managed to escape my grip, but didn't drop to the floor. Instead, she sank her teeth into my hand before working her way at my arm, biting me viciously. I was screaming, trying to get her off of me, smacking everywhere, but every time I seemed to hit her, she buried her teeth in deeper. My flesh was absolutely feeling terrible, smacking her only worsened the wounds as her teeth ripped and tore at my skin. Ultimately, I caught her with a shot that knocked her off and sent her crashing into the fridge wall. Then, I stomped and stamped repeatedly until she wasn't moving, and her broken body spilled guts onto the floor. I had to have 19 stitches, and I had to get some tetanus shots and stuff like that. I was stuck in the hospital for 72 hours due to this, and honestly, I had to quit after that. But those are my stories working fast food in North Dakota. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true scary stories from North Dakota. These stories were definitely a bit different from what we would normally cover in the swamp. These covered a bit more strange human actions, and some of them even covering some wild animals that we wouldn't t typically hear about unless you're in, like, New York City, right? Anyways, I enjoyed these stories. It was nice to take a break from the typical scary story we do here. And if you have a story that you would like to share from your home state, be sure to submit it right now at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. Currently, I'm looking for stories from Minnesota. So if you have a story from Minnesota, be sure to send it on over. I'd love to share it. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to slap that like button a bit. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it, and that helps me out a ton. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us? Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications to never miss a new episode as I upload them damn near every single day. And all things natural and supernatural. If you're on the go but don't have YouTube Premium but still want to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcast, and pretty much everywhere else you find podcasts online. I'd love to know in the comments down below what story was your favorite tonight. If you made it all the way to the end, tonight's code word is red light bulb. I'd love to see the funny comments you guys come up with. The funniest one will get pinned as usual. I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode, and thank you as always for dwelling in the swamp with me.